let's go ahead and get started. No snow out there, class in here. Um, actually looks like the sun may be coming out for the next couple of days, which would be nice. <clears throat> I did record and post the lecture from Wednesday um, all about translational initiation, elongation, and termination. I had one question online since then. Uh, so more questions, please ask me now at the beginning of lecture, or again, email them to me. One other thing that I mentioned right at the beginning there, but bears repeating, uh, I asked people whose scores increased a lot between the first and second midterm how they managed to do that, and I've posted their suggestions on how they did that on D2L, <coughs> excuse me, under the study groups section. So if you go to D2L discussion study groups, there's a whole list, I think about five or six suggestions on what to do. The one I like the best is to um, put on headphones and go for a walk and listen to my lecture. So apparently that works, at least for some people. <clears throat> so uh, we're going to finish up with translation today. Um, really not that much about translation, but there's also an opportunity for me to answer any questions that have come up as you've been reviewing a lecture, um, et cetera. So what I talked to my computer about on Wednesday was all about how not so much the ribosome works, but really translational initiation. And this is more of that alphabet soup process of the IFs, the initiation factors, the EFs, the elongation factors, and the RFs, which are the release factors why well, they call them TFs, that's probably because they already had Ts for transcription factors. So uh, those and how those fit together um, and work, the really main thing to think about there is what's involved in getting the initiator tRNA to the start codon <clears throat> that's different in bacteria and in eukaryotic systems. And then the elongation process, and I also showed this really amazing movie about how you have the elongation factor, in this case EFTU, but probably really similar to the eukaryotic elongation factor, how it actually is involved with the ribosome. And we know a lot about the structure, the high resolution structure of the ribosome, and how all those pieces fit together. You had a question. Yeah, so I think I misspoke. Did I not correct myself then? That I sometimes I like to think about the ribosome as the amino acid polymerase. I think I'm like the only person in the world who uses that term. Uh, but <laughs> conceptually, that's really what it is. It's polymerizing individual amino acids. So that's probably where I slipped up on that. Other questions, comments, misspoken things in the lecture? OK, so um, <clears throat> I will have questions on this on the final. So um, again, if other questions come up, maybe you're re-listening to the lecture or whatever, um, please let me know. Um, and we'll try and go ahead and, and look at that. <clears throat> what I didn't get to last time was sort of why translation. Well, I guess I did talk a little about a little bit and also lecture on Monday as well. Why translation is so important. Translation is how we get all of our proteins. And that process of translation, if you look at the evolution of the ribosome, is probably one of the things that was really conserved in all cellular life. And quick plug for virology next term, those are the organisms that don't have ribosomes. <clears throat> but they're completely dependent on cellular ribosomes. So it turns out, not surprisingly, if you want to have some kind of drug that is good at treating some kind of disease, and usually the treatment of that particular disease is trying to block its growth, block it making more of itself. One of the big things that is different between bacteria and eukarya is that translational initiation step, right? Because instead of making your RNA, trying to sequence binding, and the ribosome taking off, with eukaryotes, you got a cap. You have then translocation before you actually get to your start codon. So very different between bacteria and eukarya. This turns out to be extremely useful if you're trying to find a drug that works against bacteria but doesn't kill eukaryotic cells. So a lot of antibiotics, and this was actually found later than when the antibiotics were found, 
actually affect ribosomes. So tetracycline, streptomycin, chloramphenicol, erythromycin, all of these affect various different aspects of now specifically bacterial ribosomes. So great way of, again, trying to kill off one set of organisms but keep us, that other organism, intact. Flip side as well, um, pyromycin is involved with the polypeptide, again, it's being made from the ribosome, and then also some drugs that are more used in the lab than they actually are clinically, uh, chlorhexamide and <clears throat> excuse me, acinomycin that work on ribosomes. The other big class of antibiotics that, again, also work on different kinds of organisms, but in a very general case, are those that address transcription. So transcription is very different. You've got a different enzyme in bacteria than you have in eukaryotes. So RNA polymerases also are a good target. Um, rifamycin, um, and then the reason that you should not eat white mushrooms, um, alpha mannitin, um, is actually a really good inhibitor of RNA polymerase too. So um, one particular reason, again, not to eat these, eat these mushrooms because you'll block your RNA polymerase too, and if you can't make proteins, you're pretty dead pretty quickly. So <clears throat> antibiotics, again, not surprisingly, you're going to have, you're trying to direct some kind of drug to something which is specific to one set of organisms versus another set of organisms, and translation is a really good way to do that. One interesting thing is that some of these bacterial-specific antibiotics can actually also affect mitochondria, and for that matter, if you put them on plants, also chloroplasts, because those are all derived from bacteria originally. So these wonderful antibiotics that just work against bacteria can sometimes actually cause problems with mitochondria as well. This is a, a quick aside, but it's sort of a reminder that the ribosome is really, really central, and translation in general is very, very central to making cells make more of themselves, and actually literally just for homeostasis and surviving. Yeah? For the kind of exams, yeah. can you memorize the names of the antibiotics? Memorize the names and the spellings and the structures? No. <laughs> um, yeah, but they're acting mostly against ribosomes. Um, I would say, um, and that there's also some that are acting against RNA polymerases. I think that's a reasonable thing, and that some of them are bacterial specific, some of them are eukaryotic specific, and some are, are not. But if I were to give you some super duper new antibiotic, I would tell you what kind of class it was. Okay, this is not a course on antibiotics. Pathogenic bacteriology, however, they might ask you those questions. Um, <clears throat> so we've made our polypeptide. This is our amino acid polymerase um, or the ribosome. What happens with that polypeptide chain? And so in the animation that we looked at, I think it was on Monday, um, when you see the ribosome making the peptide chain, it's literally just a stretch of amino acids, one hooked up next to each other. That doesn't have any particular structure. We talked about primary structure way back when we talked about proteins. But that in and of itself is not going to have any kind of activity. So to actually have an active protein, or in this case they have a mature functional protein down here at the bottom, there are a couple of extra steps that have to happen. And the main one is going from this primary structure to the tertiary structure. This is also known as protein folding. So yeah, again, taking that primary structure going to the first secondary structures and then tertiary structures. Where does that come from? Where are you getting most of those interactions? Anybody remember back from lecture two? Hydrogen bonds, some of them. Hydrophobic interactions. Van der Waals interactions. All those weak interactions, but between all the side chains. It's not the backbone. It's all about the side chains interacting with each other. So side chain interactions with each other. Now, people have tried, and we're getting close to actually be able to predict what kind of tertiary structure you have just given the primary amino acid sequence. But it turns out that there are all kinds of different possibilities. And for a long time, people used to think that one stretch of amino acids would give you one and only one structure. Um, we've actually 
figured out that that's definitely wrong. And the classic example is some of these amyloid proteins, the things that misfold in things like Alzheimer's and, and Parkinson's diseases. But uh, nonetheless, if you have a primary sequence, most of the time it's going to be one or sometimes a couple of different final structures that it ends up in. And getting to that process is, again, this whole process called protein folding. Many proteins will also have other kinds of modifications, and then when they're finally working, they'll bind to other proteins as well. But we're first interested in, in this step. And so when people have looked at this process, what you see is that the first thing that happens, and that's actually even in that video animation that we looked at, is you have some secondary structures that form, alpha helices in particular, and then sometimes beta strands and forming beta sheets. Um, but then that only later ends up in your final tertiary structure. And so this process where you have basically the sort of intermediate between primary structure and tertiary structure is also called the molten, molten globule. And this is an example of those molten globules right here. This is a really classic kind of protein that lots of people have studied, a, what they call four helix bundle. This is the molten globule side over here in A, and this is the final tertiary structure right here. A couple of things to notice here. One is these alpha helices are all pretty far apart, and the second one is that this short alpha helix gets much, much longer, and maybe there's a second alpha helix gets added to it. And so this process, um, forming of the secondary structures, particularly of alpha helices, happens really fast. Getting to this final tertiary structure, because you have all these weak interactions and lots and lots of different ones, um, this can actually really sometimes take quite a long time to sort of figure out exactly where all of these different pieces are going to come together. So it turns out that there are, yeah, in the back. So the question is, do you see van der Waals interactions in molten globules? And the answer is yes in some and no in others. So it's mostly secondary structures. And of course, mostly secondary structures are backbone interactions. They're not side chain interactions with each other. Um, but you see sometimes you'll see some of those. But for the most part, it's going to be those hydrogen bonds that you're getting in secondary structures. OK. so. How do you get to this, you know, this final form? And again, that's what's going to give you your final function. Quite a few proteins will be made as they're coming off of the ribosome. And so again, this is exactly what we had in that animation that we had before, also red conveniently. Um, as this red polypeptide chain comes out of the ribosome, again, it's this stretched out amino acid, just linear amino acids. That then folds into a particular structure, and in this case, it's a single domain. And conveniently, we have a different color for the different domain. And this is released from the ribosome. It has its activity. It's good to go. This, unfortunately, is not what most proteins do. Um, and part of this has to do with the fact that this is a wonderful picture. Look, we've got an isolated ribosome, an isolated RNA, and a single protein that's being made. That's not what cells look like. Cells are absolutely packed with proteins and nucleic acids and everything else inside of them. And so this whole process of, oh, look, we've got you know, one nice little protein and one amino acid sequence, which is going to fold up on itself, that's great. But for the most part, you have to have some extra help. And so that extra help <coughs> is here in the form of what we call chaperones. And as the father of two girls, I know exactly what chaperones are about. They're about stopping bad interactions. So that's also exactly what chaperones do in protein folding, stopping bad interactions. And there's a couple of different ways that they do that. But <clears throat> let's look here first to sort of the overall, and we'll look at the individual chaperones in just a second here. So in most cases, you're going to go from that primary sequence to a molten globule. This doesn't actually have the right final structure. That's what we're trying to get to down here. Um, this then wobbles around a little bit. The chaperones stop it from doing something bad, wobbles around a bit. Chaperones wobble around, stop it from doing something bad, and finally gets to the right structure. Some, however, sometimes I should, excuse me, I should say, these don't actually find the right interactions, and then they get thrown in the trash. <laughs> 
And again, you know, that's what the chaperones for my daughters are supposed to do, you know, throw those extra ones in the trash. Um, can we say chaperones act like enzymes or are they enzymes? Okay, so chaperones act like enzymes, are they enzymes? We'll get back to that in just a sec. So they are, but exactly the process of catalysis is an, an interesting one. Um, they definitely hydrolyze ATP, and that's an enzymatic reaction, but they are not necessarily working on very specific substrates, and so that's the big difference in this case. These are very general kinds of processes. Um, <clears throat> how are these found in the first place? I um, have to talk about this because, of course, viruses are the most important things on the planet, certainly the most numerous things on the planet. But <clears throat> uh, the way that a lot of these things were originally found was in studying various different mutants of E. coli. And so we've talked about mutants of E. coli, we've talked about the mutes, um, different, and then we also talked about some of the mutants that you find in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the CDC mutants. Here, it's a grow mutant, so the grow E mutant. The grow E mutant is actually about growth of bacterial viruses on a particular strain of E. coli. And if you have a grow mutant, that virus doesn't get assembled properly. And again, we'll talk about a bunch of virology next term, I'm sure all of you have signed up for it, uh, that putting together the virus structure is actually really complicated in terms of all the different proteins that you have to end up fitting together. And so fitting together wrong is a big problem as far as the virus is concerned, because if you don't have the appropriate virus structure, it's not going to be functional. So that was how these mutants were originally found. Um, they're also found to be induced when, and I say induced, more is made of these things, when you shock the cells, and particularly shocking E. coli, but it turns out this happens in pretty much all organisms. If you raise the temperature a little bit, which is probably going to start to pull your proteins apart, then these chaperones are induced and presumably that's to stop the bad interactions which are happening. Now, what are those particular bad interactions? Most of those bad interactions are hydrophobic interactions. So as soon as you pull something apart, hydrophobic regions are going to be exposed. Hydrophobic loves hydrophobic, but if it's the wrong one, you've got trouble. So how do these things work? Well, the probably best understood of these are two different kinds of heat shock proteins or chaperonins. HSP60 and HSP70, why are they called 60 and 70? Because they're 60,000 molecular weight and 70,000 molecular weight. And so lots of people talk about HSPs. All that is is a different size that they're found. <clears throat> HSP60 is also known as these grow mutants. So grow mutants, again, if you mutate them, E. coli viruses don't get assembled properly. We now know that these structurally look like these kinds of containers here. And this container, uh, I think one of the researchers called it a box of infinite dilution. And so literally, again, what it's doing is protecting against those bad interactions. So you have a partially folded protein, or sometimes an incompletely folded protein, that gets stuffed into this container. Cap gets put on the top. ATP hydrolysis happens, and that ATP hydrolysis, so this is where you have enzymatic activity, it's hydrolysis of ATP, but then what seems to happen is you have interactions of hydrophobic regions with hydrophilic regions and just bounces back and forth. It's kind of like taking you know, something, putting it into your chamber, shaking it up, and waiting until it gets to the nice stable state, and as soon as it does, then the cap comes off and your correctly folded protein comes out. So that's happening usually very long after you have translation taking place. And also, if you're trying to deal with proteins that have gotten unfolded, again, potentially so some of these, these heat shock issues. Um, HSP70, or also known as DNAK, um, this seems to function much more as the protein is coming off of the ribosome. So, but again, seems to serve very much the same role. Instead of binding um, in a container, something inside a container, this is now binding on the outside and protecting the particularly hydrophobic regions of the protein from associating in the incorrect fashion. So you end up with these correctly folded proteins. And kind of an overview of this process. 
is here. And these arrows are supposed to be more or less equivalent to each other. So any kind of newly synthesized protein, this is going to be, again, coming straight off the ribosome. In some cases, about a third of the cases, they fold up by themselves, no problem at all. Many of them need chaperones as well. But it turns out there are also quite a few that don't end up folding properly. And most of this not folding properly has to do with those external hydrophobic regions on the outside. And so that external hydrophobic region on the outside is going to interact with other hydrophobic regions, potentially in that same protein or other proteins. Again, we're in a crowded cell. And those end up, if you don't take care of them, precipitating inside the cell. And this can be a real major problem. And as probably is what's causing some of these neurodegenerative diseases, things like Alzheimer's, et cetera. Um, and that's what happens if you have these proteins sticking to each other, again, protein aggregates. There is, however, a lot of quality control here. And we talked, so I should say I talked about quality control uh, last time about messenger RNAs, tmRNAs, nonstop and nonsense mediated decay. Sometimes you just end up making the wrong protein, and that protein could end up with a eat me tag at the end of it. That's what happens in tmRNA and some of the other quality control mechanisms, or just something which is incompletely folded. And this thing gets digested by, in eukaryotic cells, the proteasome, but in bacteria, there are also proteases, which are really specific for chewing up proteins which have the wrong structure. So this is the example in eukaryotic cells, how this is dealt with. This is, I like to call, the garbage disposal of the cytoplasm, getting rid of proteins that have the wrong structure, or even in some cases, getting rid of proteins that you don't want to have at a particular time. So you may remember replication initiation. That's started by ORC and then CDT and CDT, CDC6. Those get phosphorylated, and then they get degraded. What does that degradation? The proteasome. Well, if the proteasome degraded everything, we'd have problems. So there has to be a way that you can get proteins to be degraded by the proteasome. And that's our molecular zip code. And the molecular zip code here is polyubiquitin. So ubiquitin, we talked about ubiquitination before. This ubiquitination then is a signal to get the protein that's attached to it to the proteasome. Now, the business end of the proteasome actually does kind of look like a garbage disposal for anybody who's worked with them, um, and has these active sites right in the middle of it, which chew up proteins into individual amino acids. But getting your protein into the garbage disposal, that's what these regulatory subunits are here on the outside of the proteasome. And these regulatory proteins, what do they do? They bind to ubiquitin. And once they bind to ubiquitin, they say, hey, whatever's attached to this, this is what we want to degrade. And so this could be unfolded, or it could be something which has been labeled due to some other process that's happening inside the cell. So how do you see these degradation processes? It could, again, just be an unfolded protein, but also you have regulatory processes which do this. And those are, pardon me, almost there. A um, <clears throat> couple of different ways, and this is just three of the multiple different ways that this can happen. Ubiquitin is always going to be added on a lysine residue that's present on the side of the protein, and then multiple ubiquitins get added to that. You can have a <clears throat> degradation signal here, and so the degradation signal is supposed to be this sort of green or dark green loop here. So this dark green loop can be active in terms of forming a degradation signal. So what, those de what are those degradation signals? Maybe that's another better way of looking at that. How do you put ubiquitin onto proteins? Enzymes. What enzymes? E1, E2, and E3. So the ubiquitin ligase and then the ubiquitin conjugation enzymes. So those have to recognize the protein that you want to degrade. And that recognition is going to be some kind of change in structure. And so these are three different ways you can have structural changes. Phosphorylation, the classic way. You can also have two proteins that are otherwise bound to each other that then are no longer bound. And then this would be your recognition site for the ubiquitin ligase. 
or in some cases you can actually even have proteolysis that happens of your protein which will also generate a degradation signal. All kinds of different ways you can have degradation and also just proteins that have the incorrect structure, they haven't folded properly and there's a surveillance machinery that basically you know, floats around inside the cell of these ubiquitin ligases that say, hey, this is a misfolded protein, we're going to put ubiquitin on that and target it to the proteasome for degradation. So this is what, how you end up with your proteins. Proteins fold normally as they come off of the ribosome. Proteins fold with the help of chaperones. If they don't fold properly, then they get chewed up. In eukaryotes, it's going to be the proteasome. In bacteria, there are other proteases that we're not going to talk about here, but hopefully in microbiology, they'll talk about them. Okay, and those of you who are watching carefully have another question for me. Yeah, so in the HSP3 example, mm -hmm. that's, that's an example where it's refolding incorrectly the protein, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what is it doing exactly? Like specifically, what is it doing by refolding? So basically the question, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, is what's the mechanism of HSP60? What's it actually doing? People argue a lot about this, <laughs> exactly how it functions. Um, so it seems to take these unfolded proteins and refold them. How it does it is probably a reversible kind of interaction between hydrophobic patches that are in the inside. Maybe we can back up here. On the inside of this container, you know, various hydrophobic interactions that will interact with the hydrophobic pieces of the protein that are incorrectly folded. Then you have ATP hydrolysis, which changes the structure, allows those hydrophobics to potentially interact with themselves. And then multiple rounds happen of this. And then it keeps trying to happen, but then there's no more hydrophobic regions of the protein which are available to bind to these hydrophobic regions inside of the HSP60. And then once that happens, the cap comes off and the correctly folded protein comes out. Uh, that's theoretical <laughs> um, in terms of exactly how it works, I think is still a, a pretty open question. It's a very active area of research looking into how protein folding is happening, particularly in some of these neurodegenerative diseases, but also just in general how proteins get put together. Okay, more questions on folding that process. Okay, in which case we'll ask you a different question. Where are we? Here, okay, quick question. Hopefully this is really straightforward, we shall see. Um, <clears throat> most antibiotics block the activity of which of the following? Topoisomerases, DNA polymerase, RNA polymerase, the ribosome, or splicing? Ten. Aim for 100%. Let's do 100%. Five. It's the ribosome. Surprise, surprise. Um, so, getting kind of getting back to your question about you know, what do I expect you to know from that antibiotic slide? Something like this would probably be um, appropriate in terms of what we'd see on an exam. So, there are antibiotics that actually do block the activity of every single one of these, but the most common ones are going to be the ribosome. <clears> okay, <throat> hey, that shifts us to, I think, the most interesting part of this course. Again, something we could spend years talking about, yes, but we've talked about now, how you make DNA, how you make RNA, how you make proteins, how, but the question is when and where do you make proteins, make RNA, 
less so making DNA. So this is the whole process of what people call gene expression. So we have our genes in the genome. You have a promoter, you've got introns, you've got exons, etc. This gets transcribed. You have the modifications that happen to your messenger RNA, at least in eukaryotic messenger RNA, capping, elongation, splicing. Tailing will happen as well. This gets exported, exported from the nucleus. Then you have translation, protein folding, as we're just talking about today. In some cases, it gets degraded. And then finally, you end up with your active protein down here at the bottom. So each and every one of these steps, transcription initiation, capping elongation, splicing, cleavage polydential intermination, export, degradation, translation, synthesis a little less so, um, and protein degradation, all of these are regulated inside any given cell at any given time. And so now we need to shift and talk about how all of that is working. And so that's going to be basically the rest of the course is going to be talking about this regulation process, how you go from DNA all the way to final active, pro active protein. So today, we'll probably maybe get through dimers and motifs, but it's mostly about the DNA. And so the DNA in any particular cell will give you a particular organism. And this is, we've known about this really for quite a long time, you know, DNA being the genetic material, et cetera. But it was really just the DNA it was only really sort of nail in the coffin shown when cloning happened, and this is cloning in the terms of somatic cell nuclear cloning, so Dolly the sheep and now these kinds of things, that it's really about the DNA. And so the DNA inside a cell, you can have a cell, you can put a different DNA into that, and as long as all the right mechanisms are there, what that cell develops into is going to be dependent on that particular DNA. Now, all of us are multicellular organisms, but even single-celled organisms are going to be making different proteins at different times. And so how that happens is really, again, the subject of really most of the rest of the course. A lot of it has to do with DNA binding, which is why I you know, brought my favorite model back with us today. Um, that process of binding to DNA and now specific binding to DNA, most of what we talked about in terms of nucleosomes, et cetera, is nonspecific binding. We talked about specific binding for polymerases, um, origins, and promoters, but also other regulatory proteins binding to the DNA in a specific way. And we'll look at many examples of that um, throughout today and then probably on Monday as well a little bit. Most of these sequence-specific DNA binding proteins are dimers, and that means that there are actually two subunits that come together to bind to the DNA. And we'll see why that is. Actually, it turns out that there's a couple of reasons. One is specificity, and the other is flexibility. And then the various motifs. So we talked about domains before. Domains are separate parts of the protein structure, fold up, have a particular function. In each of those domains, there are motifs. And the particular motifs we're going to talk about in the next couple of lectures is going to be DNA binding motifs and dimerization motifs. Because again, a lot of these transcriptional regulatory proteins, gene regulatory proteins, are binding as dimers. So that dimerization motif. And one of the reasons you like to dimerize is cooperativity. And we're not going to get to talking about nucleosomes and nucleosome interactions today. So first, <clears throat> I wanted to talk about this whole idea of, you know, it's all about the DNA, but it's also all about the regulation of the genes in different cells, which gives different cells their different phenotypes. So here is just the example of a neuron and a liver cell. These guys have the same DNA in them, if they're coming from the same organism. Organism, of course, it has a <clears throat> nervous system, it have neurons. So amazingly different structures, but still the same DNA that they start with. The genome of the liver cell is basically identical to the genome of the neuron. Of course, every time you replicate, you're going to incorporate a couple of changes. But the vast majority of the DNA in both of these cases is identical. So 
how does a cell turn into a neuron? How does a cell turn into a liver cell? Heard that about how you have those pieces of DNA then get turned on or turned off. But it turns out that there are a lot of things that neurons need to do that liver cells need to do as well. They need to transcribe their DNA and make RNA. They need to package their DNA into nucleosomes. They need to undergo metabolism. So there are quite a few proteins that are the same in neurons and liver cells, but there are also quite a few proteins that are different. And so tuning each of those things is really, again, about regulation and <clears throat> how you end up with these different cell types. That being said, it still really is all about the DNA and then the signals that are going to get to that DNA in terms of turning one cell on or one cell off. And so most people, when they think about cloning, you know, the somatic cell nuclear cloning, I should say, um, cloning of organisms, think about dolly and you know, sheep, etc. Turns out that the first real animal cloning that was done was done in the 1950s with frogs. And so here they had frog cells that they were able to grow, just the cells individually, in a culture dish, pull out the nucleus, and then take this nucleus and put it into a frog egg that they destroyed the nucleus of that egg beforehand. And what they found was this tadpole that developed looked like that frog, and it didn't look like the frog that had produced this particular egg. And so all about the nucleus, Yes, of course, you've got proteins and other kinds of things in the nucleus as well, but it's really about the DNA. And so, again, it's this nucleus here, the transfer of the nucleus. The phenotype that you get back out is going to be due to the nuclear DNA that you had in this adult frog. And everybody should say, but Dr. Stedman, what about the mitochondria? Well, actually, the mitochondria are coming from the maternal side in the vast majority of cases. But the mitochondria seem to be pretty agnostic as far as the development of that particular organism later. Um, turns out the people have been doing this in plants for many, many, many years before people got all excited about the cloning of various mammalian cells. Again, it's a lot about being able to separate individual cells from, in this case, a carrot, but it turns out it can be all kinds of different plant cells. You can grow up single cells, and from those single cells, you can get back the whole organism here. You can also transfer the nucleus from, say, a different cell into here. All of these have to be actually pretty similar to each other. So you can't take a cell of, for instance, a human and put it into a frog egg and get a, uh, get a human back out. So there are other factors which are involved in this whole process as well. But as long as it's something which is relatively similar, you can get <clears throat> this kind of cloning and you know, cloning of the sheep, um, Dolly and Polly up here, uh, <clears throat> and also cloning of other livestock animals. Happens a slightly different way than happens with the frog cloning. Um, frogs are really nice to do these cloning experiments with because frogs' eggs are huge, relatively speaking. So um, working with mammalian eggs is considerably harder. Um, and here, <clears throat> what's done, um, and this is just shown for cows, but it's exactly what was done with Dolly and Polly 21 years ago. So um, if Dolly was still alive, um, be a very old sheep, um, but would be legal. So it's <clears throat> been 21 years since this um, first somatic cell nuclear cloning was done. Take epithelial cells, um, and we'll see, actually, it turns out epithelial cells are really pretty important. One of the neat things about epithelial cells and why you actually need epithelial cells is that these are cells that are actually continually growing because epithelium is always being sloughed. So if you think about things like telomeres, these kinds of epithelial cells actually have active telomeres because they're cells that are constantly undergoing replication. If you tried to do this with something that didn't have active telomerases, you might have a certain amount of problems with this whole process. So it turns out that, yeah, yes, it looks really easy when you do this process. The group at the Roslyn Institute that tried to do this sheep cloning, um, I think it took them about four years to finally figure out all the processes. And one of those actually turned out to be uh, 
zapping the nuclei. Um, quite exactly what this electric pulse does is not entirely clear, um, but it's absolutely required to get this um, donor nucleus into the egg, which has been you know, enucleated in terms of this process. And then once this happens, you end up with a <clears throat> cloned animal, and that's come from the epithelial cells that have come from this donor, not from the mother. And so this case here, this sheep is actually a different breed than that particular sheep. Uh, this was 21 years ago. Um, people are now cloning primates. Um, there's been a really nice example of primate cloning literally um, last year, almost exactly a year ago. The first um, primate clones um, were made through this whole um, kind of process. We're not going to go and take a look at it. Uh, people have reported that um, humans have been cloned in this process. Um, all those papers so far have been rejected, retracted, um, et cetera. So as far as we know, um, this hasn't been done with, with human embryos yet. Um, but there are still some issues to go with this. One might ask, why you go about doing this? Who cares? Um, there actually are whole processes where you can clone your pets. Um, and I think there are even processes, and you, know, you can go to companies and they will do this for you. Whether that pet ends up being identical, it's genetically identical, but whether it has the same kind of other features, open question. But this was really done in the first place to try to actually make pharmaceuticals. So the whole idea here was that you would make genetic changes in one particular animal, um, make those genetic changes, and then clone these because this process of doing these molecular changes is really expensive, very time consuming, and hard to actually go through this whole process. In the Dolly case, they actually, I think, did something like 170 of these processes and got one sheep out. So it's not a very efficient process at all. This is also partly why not a good idea um, for working with, with humans. But these sheep actually produce pharmaceuticals in their milk, and particularly protein pharmaceuticals that are otherwise really, really hard to find. And so that was the reasoning behind doing all of this cloning process in the first place. So all about the DNA, but yes, those DNAs need to get turned into protein. And so <clears throat> that gets us into how we know about how all of these things are being done. So we talked a little bit about the process of RNA-seq, or looking at RNAs inside of cells. This is another example of that. Two different genes. One of those genes is a gene which encodes a protein that is present in all cells all the time, beta-actin, which is part of the cell cytoskeleton. Anywhere you look, look at any of these different kinds of cells, you see lots of beta-actin RNA. How do you know that it's beta-actin RNA? You literally take all the RNA out of embryonic stem cell, you sequence little pieces of it, and then you line those pieces up with the genome. The higher any of these things are here means the more of that RNA you happen to have. So all these different cell lines have RNA that corresponds to the exons. This is not a really good image because the introns are tiny and the exons are huge. Should be a little bit of a different way around to be easy to look at down here. Tyrosine aminotransferase gene, you do exactly the same experiment. You isolate all the RNAs, get short sequence reads from them, line them up, and it turns out only the liver cell has any of these exons from the tyrosine aminotransferase gene because you only need that particular protein in liver cells. You don't need it in any of the other cells that are on this particular list. So example, differential expression. So lots of RNA for beta-actin in all kinds of different cells, RNA for a particular protein just in a few cells. But this is RNA, and it turns out RNA is really easy to study and really easy to detect. But as we looked at before, there are lots of steps that have to happen between RNA and actual protein. So looking at protein gives you a much better idea because at that point you now have actually had translation has happened, you've also had protein folding that happens. This is much, much harder to do. Sequencing of proteins and determining what proteins are 
is way harder than sequencing short bits of RNA or short bits of DNA. So that, <coughs> oops, here we are. This thing's not clicking like I would like. So one way that you can look at all the proteins is in something called the 2D gel, which we looked at way back when. Again, we're talking about methods right at the beginning. And so this is separating all the proteins in one particular, in this case, tissue, based on their molecular weight. And all this is is STS page in this direction and isoelectric focusing in this direction. And this is a particularly <clears throat> neat way of doing this process because you now have <laughs> tissues from brain and tissues from liver. And anything that's present in both of these, the spots are going to be the same color. So for instance, this protein right here is present in brain and in liver. Maybe this is actin. In liver, you've got some which are just present in liver. And one thing you notice here is a whole bunch of different spots here, different isoelectric points. What does people think that might be? Different isoelectric points, but the same molecular weight. Turns out it's actually also the same protein. Yeah. Charge. How will you get different charge? Not so much a folding process, but, but what kinds of changes of charge? What's a really easy way, quote unquote, to make changes of charge in proteins? Phosphorylation, exactly. And so you can, turns out you can do mass spectrometry and find out that this is actually all one protein with different numbers of phosphates that have actually been added to it. So this process, this 2D gel electrophoresis, shows you the proteins, but also shows you something about protein modification. The big problem here, of course, is identifying what all of these are. And that RNA-seq experiment, you've got RNAs, you can match them up to the genome, because you know what the sequence of the genome is. In this case, how do you identify all of these proteins? The main way that this is done is mass spectrometry. So literally cutting out this spot from a gel, putting into a mass spectrometer, and then identifying the peptides, and then figuring out what those peptides are. Um, this is a way more complicated process than doing the sequencing and lining up all of these sequences. So it's a lot more involved process, but you're getting a lot closer to what the actual final functions are at the end. So <clears throat> the overview here of this process, we just looked at where you see the different proteins. That's down here. Um, but you've got regulation happening at all kinds of different steps, going you know, from the DNA all the way to your active protein. First is transcription, and so DNA going to RNA. This is happening very early on in the process. So this is where we're going to concentrate talking about most of everything we'll talk about for the rest of the term. But not surprisingly, turning a gene on and turning a gene off here makes a lot of sense from an energetic point of view. You don't want to transcribe a gene that you don't need a protein for at all. The big problem with this is it actually takes time between going from transcription to actually having an active protein. So regulating the activity of a protein, that's going to be a really fast way to regulate. But you have to have the protein in the first place to actually do this. And so the fine tuning of your protein activity, that's going to happen usually at protein activity control but if you want to have a particular cell that's making a particular protein, most of the time that'll be a transcriptional control. So we'll talk mostly about transcriptional control, and that's all about going from DNA to RNA. This is why we spent so much time talking about promoters and general transcription factors, et cetera. Certainly revisit those. Um, there are a number of cases, and we'll talk about a couple of these, where RNA processing control happens. So your primary transcript that's made by the RNA polymerase is changed into messenger RNA through capping, splicing, and tailing. All of those things are regulated. And we talked a little bit about alternative splicing already. So that's somewhere you're going to end up with a different protein in this process. Where the RNA ends up and how it gets transported out of the nucleus is also a region where these are controlled. Once you have a messenger RNA, sometimes it gets degraded. And Sometimes it'll get translated. The amount of translation, the speed of translation, et cetera, is regulated. And then finally, we have this protein activity control giving you the active protein. So all these different levels, again, we're going to talk about 
every single one of them. In fact, mostly we've already talked about this active versus inactive in terms of phosphorylation and GTP hydrolysis activity, but mostly in terms of transcriptional control. So are we ready to jump into that? Yes, no? Are we ready to answer a clicker question first? Of course. Which of the following kinds of gene regulation is the most energy efficient in terms of numbers of NTP hydrolyzed? Transcription control, messenger RNA processing control, RNA transportation control, translation control, protein activity control. Ten, five. Okay, we don't quite have a consensus yet, so let's get to a hundred. Chat with your neighbors. We ready to go again? Mark gets it. Go. <clears throat> again, you continue to discuss this. this you know, the last, the last vote is the one that counts. Okay, bimodal distribution, protein activity control or transcription control. And the protein activity control that we talked about has to have, at least so far we looked at phosphorylation. How do you get phosphorylation? Kinase activity. Where do you get kinases from? ATP. So you just have, you know, starting out before you do anything else, transcriptional control, it's binding to DNA. You don't necessarily need any ATP hydrolysis for that. So. Um, I would say A, but again, we could argue about protein activity control as well. But I won't, <laughs> at least not today. So <clears throat> transcription factors. Um, again, molecular biologists love to use this term factors to mean proteins. These are going to be your specific transcription factors as opposed to your general transcription factors. So the, the TFs, you know, the transcription factor 2D, 2B, 2, et cetera. Those are your general transcription factors. Now we're talking about specific transcription factors, also known as gene regulatory proteins. 
About 10% of the genes in our genome, and in fact most eukaryotic genomes, encode gene regulatory proteins. That's a huge amount of the different protein genes. Turns out they're made in really, really small quantities, which makes them very hard to study. Uh, but vast number of these regulatory proteins are encoded in our genomes. So it gives you a bit of an idea how important they are in terms of making different cell types reacting to different kinds of conditions. These transcription factors bind to intact double-stranded DNA, which should basically tell you where they're going to interact. They're going to interact in the major groove of DNA because that's where the sequence-specific interaction is. Again, these are the specific DNA binding proteins. And these are also mostly what's called cis regulatory sequences. So cis versus trans, cis is next to, trans is far away. And we're actually going to see some differences here. We'll see some trans activating factors before, but for the most part, they're going to be cis sequences, which means they're right next to whatever it is they're regulating in terms of transcription. That's going to be your promoter. So regulatory sequences are going to be next to promoters. And again, these are very specific. I have a reminder, um, where do you have all of these interactions? This is just what we looked at way back when, when we talked about the structure of DNA. Um, it's all about the major groove of DNA because that's where you have all of these different hydrogen bond donors and acceptors, and they're different between GC base pairs, AT base pairs, CG base pairs, and TA base pairs. No, I don't expect you to remember the order of all of them um, on a particular exam. But that's where all of your information is. You also have methyl groups here. Methyl group is something you could also have a hydrophobic interaction interacting with these particular methyl groups. So what interacts with these? It's the amino acids and the particular amino acid side chains that like to form hydrogen bonds because all these hydrogen bond donors and acceptors they're all present sitting in the major group. And some of those, and this is just some of them, um, are asparagine and arginine. So this example here of asparagine, it's got a hydrogen bond acceptor here, a donor there. And so it's going to interact with an A in this position uh, relative to the rest of your protein. Arginine can interact with a G because it's got, <clears throat> excuse me, two hydrogen bond donors that are associated with it in its positively charged state. But this is great. Oh, look, we've got hydrogen bond donors, hydrogen bond acceptors. We know what the structures are of the DNA. We know what the structures are of the proteins. But just looking at an amino acid sequence and a DNA sequence and trying to predict how they interact with each other turns out to still be extremely difficult to do. People are getting better at it, and there are a few ways that people have been able to design specific DNA binding proteins that are going to bind to a specific DNA sequence. Really, really hard to do. That's why people love CRISPR so much, because CRISPR you have an RNA, and RNA DNA interactions are way easier to uh, predict and show that it works. These kinds of interactions, again, they're, they're hard to predict, and designing these kinds of interactions is still something which people are trying to do. And this is just an example of that. We have a nice example of asparagine interacting with an A. But in a typical DNA binding protein, these are all of the different amino acids. And that actually turns out to be asparagine 51 right here that's interacting with this A. But you have you know, arginines that also are going to interact with the backbone phosphates, as well as you know, things that are interacting with base pairs in the major group. And you even have some proteins interacting with base pairs in the minor group. And how do we know this? This all comes from high resolution structures of DNA protein complexes. And so we actually know exactly where each of those amino acids fit relative to the sequence of the DNA. Now, one of the things here, you'll notice it's mostly, there are some exceptions, but for the vast majority of cases, you actually have the side chains, again, of the amino acids that are interacting with the base pairs in the major groove of DNA. So where are they coming from? The majority of DNA binding proteins have alpha helices that fit in the major groove of DNA. 
why alpha helices fit in the major groove DNA, where the side chain in alpha helices. They're sticking out around the outside. It's one of the great things about alpha helices is that the backbone is hydrogen bonds are interacting with each other, gives you an alpha helix, and that sticks all of the side chains out. And those fit really nicely into the major groove of DNA. Yeah? By side chains, are we talking about the amino group or the carboxy group, or both? Okay, the side chains, these are the R groups. So the you know, amino group and carboxy groups, those are at the end of your chain. So, yeah, the peptide bonds are then in the middle. So it's going to be the side chains that are interacting here. So side chains interact, and then many of these cases, and this is actually best known in bacteria, and we'll see some examples in eukaryotic systems next week, alpha helix sitting in the major group of DNA. But it's not just a single alpha helix. Single alpha helices by themselves are not stable. So you have to have some other structure which is holding it in there. And in the case of bacteria, very often it's a second helix which sits on top of that. And so this motif called the helix turn helix, where you have one helix almost perpendicular to a second helix, this is a very common DNA binding motif. And again, motif, this is not a stable structure by itself. It's just part of a domain which is going to bind to DNA, helix turn helix. So as I mentioned, these are quite common in bacterial DNA binding proteins and usually transcriptional regulators. Helix turn helix, here's our first helix, second helix. That red helix is also called the recognition helix. That's the alpha helix going to sit in the major groove of DNA. As I mentioned before, many, many, many of these DNA binding proteins are dimers. So here's an example. We've got one subunit here with the extra gray helices, the other subunit here with the white helices, gray and white here, gray and white here, gray and white here. All of these have a dimeric structure with two recognition helices 3.4 nanometers apart. Why would they be 3.4 nanometers apart? Because Every 10 base pairs in your B-form DNA, you get back to the major groove on the same side of the DNA. So these guys are going to bind on the same side of the DNA in adjacent major grooves. So that's why you have them. If you look at the DNA binding of these kinds of proteins, they will bind to what are called half sites. What's a half site? So what that means is you have one of those alpha helices, again, a recognition helix, that usually is going to recognize four to five bases. And these are going to be set up in inverted repeat structures. Remember, I'll be beating on inverted repeats versus direct repeats. So here's that example here of one of these proteins, 5 prime AACAC, 5 prime AACAC, it's the same protein here, this sort of comma structure, interacting right here through the ends of the commas. This has a DNA binding motif and a dimerization motif. This is not actually binding to the DNA. The DNA binding site are these green nucleotides right here. So this process, you can now have one protein, because it dimerizes, is actually binding to 10 nucleotides. And if you think about the specificity of binding, the more nucleotides you bind to, the more specific you're going to have a particular interaction with DNA and protein interaction. So in E. coli, 4.5 <coughs> million base pairs. In eukaryotic systems, we're talking billions of base pairs. Having this kind of specificity having a larger binding site, more nucleotides that you bind to is definitely to your advantage. And having these dimers, each of which binds to a half site, one of these two inverted repeat sequences, is extremely useful. So we'll talk about eukaryotic DNA binding motifs and domains on Monday. Enjoy the sunshine. Oh, and I do have, um, if people want them, your scantrons up here. Don't everybody attack at once. I will have them on Monday as well. <laughs>